Good afternoon. Welcome to Broadband Breakfast Live Online for Wednesday, June 14th, 2023. It's Flag Day, everyone. Uh, as I say, uh, at Broadband Breakfast, uh, where, where, of which I'm the editor and publisher, we cover uh, news and do events about high capacity internet, the tools, the technologies that power them, and the impact that technology has upon, upon our lives. And uh, you know, our, our, we kind of consider our core mission to be around broadband infrastructure and around um, broadband's impact. We also cover big tech and increasingly it's been impossible to avoid the role that big tech is playing in uh, our, our economy and society. But, but you know, um, in some ways, uh, based, being based here in Washington, it's really vital to have your eye on the big picture, as well as some of these micro pictures or the pictures we kind of drill drill down deep into. And, and on the, the, the macro level, there's nothing bigger than the conflict right now between the United States and China over technology. I mean, it, it, it literally is a, a new Cold War. Now, it may not be it may not be driven at the moment, at least by military conflict. And in fact, five years ago, I, I wouldn't have even said this the way I'm saying it now. I, I have a, a brother who lived in China for 17 years, and I've been there, and, and I am so impressed, continually impressed with the dynamism that we've seen in China. And yet, uh, you know, for, for, for many reasons, many geopolitical reasons, we may or may not get into, in fact, we, we probably will get into today, uh, America has taken a different posture, and and a lot of the the uh, the sense of of um, I guess just uh, we've fallen behind comes to semiconductors, which we will be talking quite a bit about just now here. But before I get to our our great panel, I want to just say another word or two about broadband breakfast and what we what we do and what we are. As I say, we are a news and events company. We we do reporting on these topics every business day. And um, we we do most of our news uh, and reporting and, and events are, are free, are free of charge, freely available, supported by sponsors. And, and speaking of sponsors, I want to give a shout out to each of our sponsors. They include Utopia Fiber, Broadband Money, Comcast, Nokia, the Comlaw Group, Google Fiber, Broadband Now, UCLA, Michael Baker International, Bitstream Communications, Positron Access, and the California Emerging Technology Fund. Thank you to our sponsors. In addition to our free news and content on broadband and related topics, we, we've begun uh, to do a series of, of summits. And we have a very exciting uh, summit coming up in two weeks time. It's called the Made in America Summit. And I, I hope most of you who are on this uh, or watching in our, our partner uh, channels uh, will will have, have heard about it, been familiar with it. I'm going to send, after I stop talking, I'll send the link to the Zoom channel uh, so that you can see it. Uh, and, and it's a very exciting program. We're going to be talking about the confluence of infrastructure, including broadband infrastructure, green energy, and the CHIPS Act, right? And, and the role that all of these are playing in the Biden administration's investing in America or made in America agenda. That, that is coming up in two weeks time. We hope all of you will, will uh, uh, register and attend. It's gonna be at the Samsung Executive uh, Center on 700 Pennsylvania Avenue South East. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you there. Now, the third thing we do, and we, we've done this for about six months now, so relatively recent, we've launched our Breakfast Club. And our Breakfast Club is our premium uh, service available for those who subscribe. Uh, we offer it at $99 a month or $590 a year. So you get um, years access for the price of six months. And we do a special premium report every month. This month we did one on the Chips and Science Act. And so it gives a, a incredibly detailed primer on the, um, the, the development of, and, and if you will, the, the issues under underlying the Chips and Science Act. Again, uh, we hope you'll uh, sign up, uh, join, uh, become a member of the Breakfast Club and, and have access to that. Um, and it, it is available, uh, right now. And in fact, I, I just want to mention that if you want to attend the um, the Made in America Summit on June 27th, 
uh, tickets are available at two forty nine. If you're a nonprofit or a broadband provider, ninety nine dollars. And the best discount of all is if you're a Breakfast Club member. So forty nine dollars to attend the Made in America Summit for those of you who are members of the Breakfast Club. Well, with that, I want to turn specifically to our topic at hand uh, and our panelists who will help us address this. Uh, our panelists, and they'll speak in this order, are Martin uh, Rasser, who's the managing director of De Daytona. Uh, I, I'm sure I missed that. I, he'll, he'll correct me, but it's a very exciting company, and I look forward to him explaining what, uh, what this company does. Uh, and Martin, uh, as well as our other panelists, are very steeped in this issue. In fact, um, uh, as the managing director of um, this company, uh, which is an open source intelligence company, uh, he manages the U.S. operations, and they they very deeply track um, issues of uh, intelligence in terms of technological innovation. So Martin will talk more about that. He's first up. Following Martin, we're going to hear from Jacob Feldjoyce. Uh, and again, I apologize. I probably should have gotten the, the, the pronunciation key. But Jacob, very excited to have you. Jacob's a data research analyst at uh, Georgetown, uh, Georgetown University's Center for Security and Emerging Technology. And uh, there he, he very closely tracks U.S. China technological competition, emerging technologies, talent flows, and China's foreign influence, as well as AI and supply chains and export controls. And then uh, batting cleanup will be Hannah Kelly. Hannah is a research assistant with the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. And there she focuses on biotech, national technology strategy, international coordination on responsible technology use. So, um, and she's also previously worked at the International Trade Administration at the U.S. Department of Commerce and uh, at the Permanent Observer Mission to the Holy See of the United Nations. So all those are very interesting and look forward to hearing Hannah's perspective on this. So again, CHIPS Act, very big piece of legislation uh, uh, trying to address a, a big challenge. Uh, let's turn it over to you, Martin. Tell us a little bit more about your company and how you see the CHIPS and Science Act impacting these big issues of today. Well, Drew, thank you so much for having me. And it's it's great to join uh, Hannah and Jacob to discuss this important topic. So I'll um, kick off with some thoughts on the CHIPS and Science Act, and then I'll tell everyone a little bit about Daytena, who we are, what we do. Um, so, you know, this bill was a long time coming, right? There were many fits and starts, a lot of debate, and for good reason. It's one of the most consequential bills, in my opinion, that Congress has passed in decades. Now, much of the focus has been on what the bill means for the U.S. semiconductor industry, and I know we'll talk a lot more about this later. So I want to focus my initial remarks on the other aspects of the bill. Uh, in a way, I see the real meat of the bill actually being the focus on research and innovation across the spectrum of science and technology. The CHIPS and Science Act authorizes the largest five-year investment in public R&D in American history. So that's nearly $170 billion in key programs. And we're talking AI, 6G telecommunications, energy storage, and much, much more. So the bill also has provisions for the formulation of a national technology strategy, uh, which we need to guide long-term US tech policy. And it also has uh, an initial provision aimed at placing restrictions on S&T infrastructure investment spending by US firms in China. Uh, this is something that's been the topic of um, you know, a, an executive order that is uh, being considered by, uh, by the White House now. Now, such investments by the government not only have precedent, uh, they are vital. If you think back to uh, the Cold War, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s in particular, uh, you know, government funding was essential to developing the transistor, the global positioning system, and the internet. These are inventions that transform the world economy, and they underpin the U.S. economy today. We're talking about these types of investments in the Chips and Science Act. It's a continuation of these policies. 
and investments in research, infrastructure, and talent at this level are exactly what is needed to sustain and promote long-term U.S. competitiveness. So why is this competitiveness so important? Well, simply stated, the United States faces a challenge like no other in its history. Um, a strategic competition with a highly capable and increasingly resourceful opponent, one whose worldview and economic and political models are at odds with the interests and values of the world's democracies. Technology, which is a key enabler for economic, political, military power, is front and center in this competition. So I see this bill as a potential cornerstone of a long-term U.S. strategy to maintain its place as the world's premier science and technology power. Now, I, I say potential because I do want to remind everyone that most of the funds are authorized, not appropriated, uh, which, of course, is a, is a vital difference. So I'm personally keeping a close eye on what Congress does next. Uh, the CHIPS Act, uh, the CHIPS portion of the act is appropriated. Commerce has a CHIPS office set up, which is starting to disperse those funds. But we have to remember the vast majority of this bill, and again, I'll reiterate, I think the most consequential aspect of this bill is not yet appropriated. And that's something that uh, we have to keep an eye on, particularly when we have debates in the Congress um, tied to the, uh, the debt ceiling and so forth, where there's a big push to reduce discretionary spending like this. Now, um, a few words about Daytena. Um, so we're a technology company. Uh, we have expertise in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And what we used with those capabilities is we have built an unparalleled open source intelligence platform specifically focused on information about China. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of insight into Chinese corporations, universities, research institutes, all the key people at those entities and how they're all connected, not just with each other, but also with uh, the uh, People's Liberation Army in particular. So if you want to understand the broad uh, civil military fusion ecosystem in China, Daytena is a tremendous resource for that. Um, as well as understanding the research directions at specific universities. We have a ton of information such as patents and research grants that help you gain insight into that. And in particular for people concerned with matters of economic security, because you have the insight into linkages with entities of concern, it provides a very valuable tool to be able to evaluate uh, the effectiveness and the potential for export controls and sanctions as well. Now, currently, um, we uh, cater exclusively to clients in allied governments, um, of which we have numerous clients in place today. Um, we are looking at the potential for other offerings that would be available to non-government clients as well. Um, but I'm happy to talk offline with people uh, about that. I'll put my uh, my contact information in the chat field. But uh, with that, Drew, let me uh, turn it back to you because I'm very eager to hear what Hannah and Jacob have to say about the this important bill as well. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for that that uh, that background. Um, let's go ahead and turn to you, Jacob, to tell us a little bit about uh, how you in in your work, uh, you know, in 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 following this topic. Uh, see the, China, the, the, the Chips and Science Act and see competition with China. Thanks so much, Drew. Um, I'll, I'll start with a couple of thoughts on the science half of the bill uh, to build off of what Martin talked about, and then I will uh, talk for a couple of minutes about the, the chip side. So on the science side, uh, I completely agree with what Martin said. It has the potential to be far more consequential, I would argue, than the CHIPS half, but that is contingent on appropriations. It's only authorization so far. I'm particularly excited about the potential for uh, changes to the National Science Foundation. Uh, the science half of the bill set up the, or, or authorized additional funding for the TIP directorate, which I believe is Technology Innovations and Partnerships. And why is this so important? 
innovation is the process of taking science to market. If you want to realize the economic benefits of innovation, it's not enough to, or economic, economic benefits of science, it's not enough to just be a science powerhouse as the United States already is, but you need to also be able to commercialize these scientific discoveries. So this is an area where the U.S. has historic, historically struggled, at least relative to our performance in basic research. And the TIP directorate uh, was stood up to help resolve this problem by helping, for example, universities improve their technology transfer programs and also fostering collaboration between universities, private sector, and government. And I, I think the potential for this, this directorate is high. It's very exciting but it will only be maximally transformative if it's fully appropriated. It's starting to do great work with the resources it already has. So for example, I think just today, the, the Regional Innovation Engines Program announced its semifinalists, which is very exciting, but there's the, the, the potential is tenfold if, if they actually appropriate, if Congress goes and appropriates the, the funding up to the authorization levels that have already been set. So to put this in perspective, the, the National Science Foundation as a whole right now, I believe, is about $9 billion annually. Um, and the authorization level uh, set by the Chips and Science Act would bring NSF up to about uh, $17, $18 billion by 2027, which is a large increase. Um, but as, as it currently stands with the budget process, it seems unlikely that we're going to get anywhere close to that. So now switching sides to the, the CHIPS half of the bill, the, the message I want to communicate uh, is that implementation is key. So in November, my colleague Vishnu Kanan and I published a report through the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, laying out some key considerations and also potential pitfalls for implementing the CHIPS half of the CHIPS and Science Act. And we offer a bunch of specific recommendations for how the CHIPS program office and the Commerce Department, which is chiefly tasked with implementation of the CHIPS Act, um, can Im improve or, or can uh, implement more effectively. And I, I won't go through those now, but I, I do want to touch upon a, a broader strategic framework that we also outline in the, the article, which is that this kind of industrial policy to uh, improve the resilience of supply chains needs three things. First, it needs to be informed by more data. It needs to aim to achieve measurable targets. And it also needs to incorporate scenario and crisis planning. I'm not going to get into those details at the moment, specifically what I mean by those, but I'm happy to discuss it throughout the, the conversation. Um, and, and also this framework could be broadly applied to other critical value chains besides just semiconductors, such as electric vehicles or other clean energy technologies. All right, I'll leave it there. Looking forward to the conversation, guys. No, thank you very much. Uh, there's 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 a lot here, a, a lot uh, that that all of us, or at least me, are are struggling to absorb, and um, and and really, um, you know, sort of where we go from here, right? And and I'll, I'll highlight some of these percentages about America's semiconductor, um, you know, uh, role uh, in, in a moment. But let's let's turn to you, Hannah, to give give us your thoughts on again the Chips and Science Act, but also where it fits in the broader picture of the technological competition uh, going on right now. Sure. So first of all, just echoing my fellow panelists, I'm really pleased to be here with both Jacob and Martin and grateful to you, Drew, and to Broadbrand Breakfast for hosting this conversation. Um, as Martin said, given how consequential this act is, especially the science side, but also obviously the chip side, which is of constant conversation these days, um, given how much bipartisan work went into getting it across the finish line, uh, its implementation, understandably, is under very close scrutiny. And as Jacob said, implementation of the chip side of the act in particular is really key. Um, when we're thinking about how uh, the Chips and Science Act will be graded in the near term, but then also uh, in the long term, implementation is really what it comes down to when we give that report card. Um, and so there are investments in U.S. semiconductor manufacturing capacity that obviously will have really important near-term effects and impacts on local communities, on the U.S. labor force, um, for the sector itself, obviously, both with domestic capacity and globally and how the U.S. contributes to uh, 
the efforts of allies and partners in the global semiconductor industry. It also matters for a number of other key technology sectors that rely on chips, so biotechnology, artificial intelligence, um, quantum computing and communications um, to achieve both commercial and defense objectives. So semiconductors are really key in a lot of different ways. Um, and so the near-term impacts of this legislation are important. But I think the real thrust of the chip side of the legislation is to have a positive longer-term impact on the sector um, to sort of resuscitate or breathe new life into the industry rather than carrying it or bailing it out. There are cyclical you know, downturns when it comes to semiconductor uh, dynamics, but what's really important here is to sort of think of it as cranking the engine on the US uh, semiconductor industry on a car that in some ways has stalled, but has really good bones. So if we give it some concerted near-term attention, hopefully that uh, investment now will sort of pay in dividends later. Um, but then there's also other long-term implications at play with the CHIPS Act that kind of goes beyond the industry itself. So implications for how the United States and especially Congress considers pursuing industrial policies for other sectors in the future, if that becomes a tool that, uh, that Congress decides is sort of needed to bolster critical and emerging technology sectors across the board. Um, we aren't necessarily ready, in my opinion, for a CHIPS for bio or a CHIPS for quantum, just given um, sort of the, the uh, literacy gap with uh, the U.S. government in, on those areas with some of the sort of more complex dynamics at play just with technology sectors that haven't been as fully developed. But we don't want to wait to start thinking about what that could look like until we hit a shock like we did during COVID-19 when we experienced you know, large scale supply chain disruptions when it came to semiconductors. So starting to get the wheels turning is really important. Um, and we want that full toolkit to be at our disposal to help boost those sectors as well. So seeing how the incentive structures, the tech hubs, the workforce uh, investments play out on the semiconductor industry is gonna be really important for uh, informing congressional appetite to pursue similar um, policies in other areas. Um, so I'll stop there so we can get into discussion, but I think kind of zooming out, this has a lot of implications for what Congress is willing to look into and pursue in the future. Wonderful. All right, let's go ahead and um, uh, be a panel. And um, I'm going to go ahead and um, highlight a, a particular, uh, well, actually, I'm going to say, Hannah, you used the word, right? The industrial policy word, right? And and that used to be such a, a curse, right? I mean, whereas, you know, in, in these more populist days, I think that um, people are basically giving serious consideration, you know, what what is the industrial policy that the United States needs to have? And and from my perspective, uh, you know, I think that, you know, we, we obviously we're going to we have and will talk about China, but but even the, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been another wake up call in the sense that, you know, the West uh, has has really had to think about um, rethinking the whole notion of the global free trade. I mean, free trade is still quite a good and important thing. I don't mean to throw free trade under the bus, but but I think that that it is true that that geopolitical events, China's rise, uh, you know, now has a larger navy than the United States. Uh, Russia, while not nearly as capable as they appeared to be militarily, um, you know, still have in, shown incredible disruption and 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 devastation in Europe. And um, you know, I want to highlight what uh, President Biden. In actually two consecutive State of the Union addresses in a row, he's he's highlighted chips and semiconductors. He had, of course, the uh, Pat Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of Intel, uh, in the room in 2022, and this year in 2023, he almost made it like the the structure of of all of the domestic policy, and and, and highlighted the fact that uh, you know America used to produce. Uh, forty percent of of the world's chips, and now it produces only twelve percent of semiconductors. And and as as he you know he, he highlighted uh, in the State of the Union, um, you know what we saw what happened during the pandemic. This President Biden, when chip factories shut down overseas, today's automobiles need three thousand chips each of those automobiles, but America's automakers couldn't make enough cars because there weren't enough chips. Car prices went up, people got laid off, so did everything from refrigerators 
to cell phones. We can never let that happen again. Biden dramatically continued. That's why oh, that's why we came together to pass the bipartisan Chips and Science Act. And it was bipartisan, right? So of these two big pieces of legislation, of the three big pieces of legislation we're going to be talking about at our event, our Made in America Summit, uh, Tuesday, June 27th, two of them, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Chips and Science Act, were largely bipartisan, strong uh, strong, a strong majority passed with support from both sides. The not so the Inflation Reduction Act, the Green Energy Provisions, which was uh, a Democrat, uh, a Democratic only driven bill. Okay, so I've raised a little bit of that context here, and and I want to um, uh, turn to our our panelists and say, uh, how much of what we're seeing in the Chips Act is really driven by geopolitics and by a concern that America doesn't have the capacity that it that it might need if we were to be in a hostile situation and how much of it is just kind of good on its own terms right i mean i don't know if it makes sense to disentangle this but i'd love each of your thoughts on sort of the role that geopolitics plays in driving the chips act and what 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 else it does or or, or how else it will help if indeed you believe it will help american manufacturing of semiconductors and other um uh, industrial products so let's, let's go to martin first and just go through our, our panel Sure, Drew. Yeah, uh, very important question. Uh, you know, I see geopolitics as as being the the main driver uh, behind bills like like the Chips and Science Act. Um, you know, over the past few years, uh, you know, we've realized how brittle U.S. supply chains are, right? And, and um, that was really underscored during the pandemic when we couldn't get the protective equipment. Uh, there were concerns about access to medicines and so forth. But then when you really start looking at the issue more broadly, we found you know, eventually, yes, we have critical dependencies, single points of failure in very important supply chains. So part of that is the the China competition, right? Where uh, we see certain supply chains where we are highly dependent on an, an adversary nation for inputs uh, such as rare earth materials. Um, but then there's other concerns specific to semiconductors, which are of a different nature. Now, fortunately, a lot of these dependencies are in countries that are US allies, but those are still issues that need to be addressed. So the fact that one company in Taiwan, TSMC, accounts for about half of the world's uh, fabrication of semiconductors, uh, nine, over 90% of the, the most leading edge semiconductors, a single company in the Netherlands that makes the machines that you need to, uh, to use to make those advanced chips. And then there's one German company that makes the lenses for that machine. You know, take any one of those companies out of the equation, you've got a big problem. And there's numerous other examples in raw materials, uh, precursor chemicals, and other inputs. So what, what you see happening now in Washington and in Brussels, Tokyo, Seoul, is a, a reevaluation of what risks are acceptable and what which ones you can mitigate and which ones just have to be addressed. And that's that whole concept of selective decoupling or de-risking as people are starting to call it now, where certain supply chains need to be remapped. And that's why you start seeing investments in new mines for rare earth elements and the processing facilities for those materials. And ultimately that's what's driving the U.S. CHIPS Act, but it's also driving the CHIPS Act in the European Union and the semiconductor-related policies in Japan, South Korea, India. People are looking to rebalance, ultimately, and geopolitics is a huge driving force behind it. We want to hear from the others, but let me just quickly respond and ask Martin, will a European CHIPS Act be in tension with a U the U.S. CHIPS Act? Are they going to be kind of like zero-sum competition? Or is there a way in which Democratic allies 
uh, approaches to avoiding um, dependence on non-democratic ally, non-democratic nations kind of can work together, i.e. a European and a, a U.S. CHIPS Act working together? I'd say on the whole, the fact that our allies are pursuing similar industrial policies, particularly uh, specifically related to chips, is is good because it it builds out that resilience in the supply chains that we're looking for. But yes, there is um, potential that we start working across purposes. For example, by placing too much emphasis on new fabs and not paying enough attention to advanced packaging capabilities, the raw materials that you need as inputs, but also, and I think this is the area where we can uh, have the most effective collaboration is, is talent, right? All these industries, you need people. And we, we have a shortfall in talent here in the United States. All our allies have the same problem. And that's, I think, one very uh, an area that's very ripe for uh, collaboration amongst the like-minded countries in order to address these issues. But I am personally a proponent of the concept of a, a broader semiconductor alliance of the United States and our key allies so that we can address these issues um, more effectively than we are today. Thank you. Uh, Jacob and Hannah, how do you see the kind of mix of geopolitics versus domestic politics? Yeah, I mean, like like you and Martin said, it's it's a mix. Um, I don't know how much we can disentangle them um, because they're often spoken about in such broad terms that encompasses both. I think you could try to you could try to tease out uh, concerns re related to our own domestic capabilities, concerns related to China's capabilities, and then also you could look. At the the relative difference between capabilities um, as as kind of like a third area of concern, um, but ultimately they they kind of get wrapped together. And I, and I think the the more helpful, uh, uh, I, I guess, grouping to make has to do more on the policy side or the solution side um, in in terms of policies that aim to to. Uh, promote American domestic innovation versus policies that aim to protect um, uh, U.S. tech and innovation advantages. So this promote protect framework is something that we we talk about a lot at CSET, um, and I think that that's a helpful way to kind of split out the different policy areas that we're talking about. You know, on the promote side, we have things like the Chips and Science Act that are attempting to uh, to kickstart American innovation, excuse me, American innovation in certain sectors. And then on the promote on the protect side, we have uh, policies like export controls and innovation, or excuse me, and investment controls um, and sanctions. Uh, so breaking it out in this way, I think, I think tends to be useful. I just want to touch real quick on um, this, this question about uh, international coordination, I think is super, super important, particularly between the US and the EU. We're starting to see some of that, uh, you know, pu publicly through uh, readouts from the the US EU Trade and Technology Council, it's difficult for us to know in the public space how much is going on behind the scenes. Um, but it certainly appears that there is a solid amount of coordination between the US and the EU on these uh, semiconductor subsidy issues. Um, and that's, you know, I, I certainly have concerns about a subsidy race. Uh, I, I, I'm not confident that it that it will happen, but there are definitely some kind of preliminary pieces of evidence and reports that, uh, you know, uh, Intel asked Germany to increase the subsidy level for their um, uh, for the fab that they were planning to build there saying that you know they they needed to receive this this increase in investment in order for for them to still consider that site. So there's definitely a lot of negotiation going on and how effectively the US and the EU coordinate will determine the the, the extent to which these companies like Intel and TSMC can play governments off one another. And I'll leave it there. Thanks for giving a specific example. I was about to ask, but you you gave it, so so thank you, Hannah. What's what are your thoughts on the, this this question here, the geopolitical question? Yeah. So as Martin said, the pandemic highlighted a lot of critical dependencies 
in many ways that highlighted, I think, the best of globalization um, and digitization in cross-border info sharing and how the international community was able to largely stay the course and continue working towards cooperation in a whole host of multilateral fora, be it the UN, NATO, the Quad, et cetera. So we saw a lot of good in how society had to be siloed physically during the pandemic, but a lot of the work put into creating these um, dialogue channels really was able to be maintained. But it also highlighted a lot of ways in which globalization and diffused supply chains has led to some concerning access gaps when it comes to critical and emerging technologies. And then kind of taking it one step further, highlighted maybe the potential for weaponizing those vulnerabilities and those gaps, depending on what players are sort of moving in the space. Um, and so the national security concerns are obviously very prominent. They've been highlighted by um, Secretary Raimondo, they've been highlighted by Jake Sullivan, um, they've been highlighted really by all of the key decision makers and the implementers when it comes to the CHIPS Act, um, that the national security concerns are at the forefront. But I think in step with that sort of reminder is always this reminder that economic competitiveness and technological competitiveness and national security are increasingly intertwined and harder and harder to compartmentalize, just given, again, how globalization has taken hold, but also, as Martin mentioned earlier, how technology is becoming this critical indicator of global power. Um, and I think that's also really important to note that as uh, as Jacob pointed out, like the complementary components of the promote and protect are really important. So promoting uh, US economic and technological competitiveness and then the national security protect components, they can't really be separated or distinguished all too much. Um, as far as the drivers of the CHIPS Act, I think, I think it's fair to say that at the end of the day, we can we can call them out or we cannot call them out. But in many ways, China is one of the drivers of, of this CHIPS Act. Um, when you have a player as important as TSMC uh, to an industry and there's sort of constant uh, aggression and constant sort of flirting with um, with trying to move on uh, Taiwan's capacity in this space from China, it's it's concerning and it, it spurs other players in the industry to want to figure out alternative uh, sources for different materials or different capacities, um, but also ways to support TSMC's operations and, you know, onshore some of those uh, capabilities to the United States. So that's all I think wrapped up in it. Um, but there's also the, the reality that the shortages during the pandemic touched all of American society. And I think um, sometimes we don't give you know, the average American in their home who didn't get their dishwasher for eight months credit for also spurring some of these conversations to the fore when it comes to their own Congress people. So there were issues with appliances, there were issues with the auto industry and being able to get new and used vehicles just because of how everything shook out. But then there were even more concerning issues with the access to ventilators and how chips also power a lot of our healthcare system. Um, and then you have, you know, the compounding issues with are we going to be able to, um, to equip our national defense capabilities given these cleavages as well. And the average American also cares about that component too. So I think there was sort of equal parts national security thrust to get us moving in this space, but we also can't discount the fact that the average American really wanted their dishwasher and that's not nothing. Right. Well, when 50% of the chips globally are made by TSMC and 90% of the advanced ones that that's kind of the one statistic that's just sends shivers down a lot of people's spines. I just want to share this is the report that I referred to earlier. This is uh, the Broadband Breakfast Club report impacts of the Chips and Science Act. Uh, you know, uh, highlights both the political infrastructure and issues. And I want to kind of, you know, uh, one of the, the issues we talked about is um, uh, what the rules and the process, because this is a large pool of money, 280 billion, uh, kind of uh, at least in, in various buckets. And we can we may be able to talk a little bit about those. But I want to raise an issue that we did touch upon in this report about the impact on the Democratic allies of the United States, of course, the impact that the CHIPS Act is likely to have on the People's Republic of China, and as well, the impact on America and American investments and how we're seeing more investments of that sort. And again, this is highlighting uh, uh, not only this report, but our Made in America Summit happening two weeks from now. So let me ask a question prompted by what I've just shared briefly. And that is, is it fair to sort of be concerned about every type of of chip right like so so like for example some of the democratic allies in the united states or companies made in these in these countries uh 
Taiwan, uh, China, uh, excuse me, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, um, Japan have raised a concern that these, quote, guardrail provisions uh, could impact their ability to have chip manufactured in, in other countries as part of their processes. So let's just talk a little bit about this, about high-end chips, about chips generally. When you're talking 3,000 chips in a in a uh, an automobile and chips in dishwashers and and um, and and refrigerators and the like. I mean, we're talking lots and lots and lots of chips. And so, is it really kind of the end goal to try to create all chips manufactured outside of countries that could potentially be, uh, you know, uh, competitors or or in some scenario hostile to the United States? What what are your thoughts on sort of like the variety of high end, mid end, low end chips and whether you know, the end goal is, as I've just stated, or whether we can continue to have trade with lots of countries, whether or not they are part of the democratic world. What are your thoughts on that, each of you? Uh, sure, happy to uh, to jump in and start. Um, you know, it's 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 unrealistic for for any one country to have a, an indigenous, you know, entirely indigenous semiconductor industry. So, you know, that's and that's also not the intent of of the Chips Act. Um, I think when you combine the uh, the Chips Act with the October seven export controls, you know, the Biden administration is clear that yes, yeah, certain types of chips, um, and then in particular restrictions on. Um, the ability of Chinese firms to produce certain chips uh, that's off the table. Um, it appears that um, you know South Korea and the Netherlands um, now by and large agree with that assessment and they're going to come forth with their own restrictions. I think ultimately the goal of all these um, semiconductor related policies is to just have more geographic diversity in the overall supply chain. Um, obviously, Taiwan is a geopolitical uh, flashpoint is particularly vulnerable. Um, and so at least having some advanced cap uh, capabilities in other parts of the world, so that in the event of a conflict over the, uh, the Taiwan Strait, that there is still capacity in other parts of the world that could pick up at least some of the slack. Um, what will be interesting to see, because uh, since you mentioned China's uh, reaction to this, you know, Beijing has been pursuing um, much greater capabilities in semiconductors that they have today for a few decades now, and particularly started doubling down on that strategy back in 2018 when uh, ZTE was um, was sanctioned. Um, you know, Beijing, if I if I were sitting there, I would be focusing on trying to corner the market on the, on the so-called legacy chips where, you know, they do have uh, pretty good capabilities and you could build up a pretty strong position in the, in the global market on that. Um, that, that would be an interesting play to see if they can make that happen. Um, in other parts of more advanced fabrication, uh, they're, they're just, generations behind and probably will not get there. And so by legacy chips, are we talking about older chips? Are we talking about just sort of more routine chips and why would yeah, that, yeah. So these are would the that chips be bad? That... Would it be bad for, you know, a country, even China to have a quote corner of the market on legacy chips? Uh, you know, it, it bad in the sense that it gives Beijing leverage that a lot of people wouldn't want to see. But if you think about chips going into um, automobiles and certain consumer products, yeah, that's where um, Beijing could be quite strong. Um, and, you know, if you're going to deny them the ability to develop more advanced chips, that a uh, logical area for growth would be um, older uh, generation chip designs. Hannah or um, or Jacob, you want to weigh in on this? I, I do have a follow up, and we've got some questions I want to ask from our audience here. Yeah, I'll just jump in here real quick. Um, I think Martin is absolutely right. There are kind of two complementary objectives that the Biden administration, you know, in addition to Congress, are attempting to achieve with respect to advanced semiconductors and particularly semiconductors fabricated at or below the 18 nanometer level. 
which is both to stop China from developing indigenous capabilities to manufacture those chips, which is essentially what the part of what the October 7th export controls do, and then also to geographically diversify the manufacturing base for those chips so that it is not as concentrated, um, particularly for the, the, the most advanced sliver of that subset. Um, so it's not as geographically concentrated as it currently is. So you've both referred to the October 7th. So these are the export controls on the most advanced chips. Could could you speak a little bit, whoever would like to take this, speak a little bit about this. How was it different from what existed before and what impact has it having or will it have on People's Republic of China's production of semiconductors? You want to take this one, Hannah? Sure. I know Martin and I both wrote op-eds about this, so I didn't want to cut you off. <laughs> um, yeah, so the October 7th uh, rule that came out from the Department of Commerce um, Bureau of Industry and Security, um, the, the real thrust of it was a national security focus, but there were really important human rights implications for it as well. Um, so it targeted, like you said, advanced node chips and supercomputers to the PRC, but it also targeted uh, or captured um, the issue of U.S. persons and equipment that support Chinese development and production. So really trying to get at all sides of how China is uh, accelerating in this space, trying to gain ground in this space. Um, and it goes beyond the previous measures, um, which restricted commercial chips to Chinese telecommunications giant Huawei, um, but also added, you know, a number of affiliates to the U.S. entity list um, due to connections to PRC surveillance efforts. All of that had sort of already taken place, but this went a significant step further um, to try and uh, you know, interrupt Chinese defense tech development, but also sort of get at some of the human rights violations that are taking place in China, where they're using these advanced node chips to power some of their surveillance systems, specifically with the Uyghurs, for example. Um, and so in many ways, this was sort of a, a shocking uh, move to perhaps those not following the issue very closely. But I think given the Biden administration's cadence on really wanting to take a firmer stance in not only um, trying to remain competitive in the semiconductor industry, but also um, sort of disrupt the illiberal uses of, of critical and emerging technologies abroad, especially if it's happening using US tech or using US component parts. Um, I think it, it was in some ways surprising, but in some ways seemed like a very natural step at the time. What 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 is Beijing doing in response, or what, what could they do in response? How does this How does this movie play out, so to speak? I can jump here with a couple. Jump in here with a couple things. Um, so, for one thing, to this this kind of goes back to to Martin's point about mature and legacy chips. Uh, there is there's been reporting that uh, officials and uh, officials in Beijing and also Chinese companies are kind of uh, recognizing the fact that they will not be able to compete effectively at the leading edge when it comes to semiconductor manufacturing. The controls implemented by the U.S. are very uh, broad and, as Hannah said, come at the problem from a variety of angles, which just makes it really, really hard. And so there has been some reporting that Beijing may be shifting its strategy to instead focus on uh, increasing its production or share of global production at the for mature and legacy chips. And that's where this this concern, this potential risk about about Chinese companies gaining an outsized share of that market comes into play. Um, very early days, uh, Chinese companies still have a very, very small share of of uh, mature and legacy manufacturing capacity. So we kind of have to wait and see um, whether this even this risk even materializes. Um, but it certainly is there. Aside from that, they are also mobilizing a, another round of the the big fund, which is this investment fund into Chinese uh, uh, semiconductor companies. And so I I believe that they've already either already selected the the next round of Chinese companies that will benefit from this investment, or they're in the process of doing so. And there's there's been reporting about other. Um, uh, investment efforts at the national and also at the subnational level. The last thing I'll say is that Beijing has also attempted diplomatically to convince uh, Japan and the Netherlands not to uh, get on board with uh, with um, the 
October export controls. And as we've seen over the past month or two, that effort has been largely unsuccessful. So we we want to we want to kind of come back to 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 the United States and 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 talk a little more specifically about kind of what uh, the Chips Act provides from a money perspective. But but let's get these questions from our audience or comments. Daniel Smith asks, "Good to support science and research and development, but then not export so much of manufacturing." Uh, not sure what the question there is. Daniel, feel free to elaborate in the 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 the, the notes here. Bruce Wolf asks, economically, if significant subsidies are provided to the private sector where profits are high, how does the public get credit monetarily for having supported their businesses and profits? Um, that's a fair question. Uh, I mean, are these high profit uh, companies uh, really in need of a handout from Uncle Sam, Jacob, Martin, Hannah? Um, you know, the ultimate purpose of the CHIPS Act is to uh, provide incentives for these companies to expand their manufacturing capacity in the United States. Um, you know, this is something that would not have happened otherwise because the, the cost of labor uh, is, is higher in the United States. You know, there's, from a purely economic standpoint, um, you wouldn't do that otherwise. That that's why so much of this fabrication capacity has moved outside of the United States, primarily to to East Asia. It, it's cheaper, um, and, and that you know is is the heart of the, the argument of of globalization, right? You move your um, your activity to where you can get the most for your money. Um, I think the calculation uh, with policymakers now is that the the cheapest option isn't always necessarily the best one from a, a national security standpoint and you know the chips act isn't designed to to bring everything back home that's that's not going to happen a the the amount of funding is just way too small um you know a single fab costs anywhere between you know 10 and 20 billion dollars to, to make uh so that you know relatively speaking the chips act is a drop in the bucket of what you you would need but I think ultimately the goal is to bring enough back that you re-stimulate uh, an industry that that the United States had by and large lost um, with the job creation, but more importantly, the, the know-how that is built back up by bringing some of this capacity back home. Um, you know, this could be a, a small investment that pays much larger dividends um a generation or two down the road that, that ultimately is what the, the goal of this type of industrial policy what about bringing it not necessarily back to the u.s but to you know friendly democratic allied countries uh is is there any accounting for for that uh, in the implementation of the chips act um jacob uh, or I, I, yeah i don't believe in the chips act specifically but you know again that speaks to why you want to coordinate these types of policies with your allies um so that you can look across the board i mean we're still competing with each other but we're doing so in in a, in a way that that boosts our collective security in the sense that um you you have that resilience that we're all looking for in the supply chain um but but uh you know jacob uh, hannah let me uh turn it over to you for your thoughts on that point. Yeah, I can hop in here. Um, I think at the end of the day, the United States is trying to shore up its own capacity. We don't wanna be as affected by future shocks um, domestically, but we also, I think, want to ensure that we are a good partner. And being a good partner means bringing a lot to the table. It means having um, sort of a resource um, flexibility to offer different things in different conversations when it comes to partnering on critical and emerging technologies. And so I think in a lot of ways, we're investing in domestic capacity to strengthen our own situation and our own competitiveness. But the more that we strengthen our own situation, the more that we partner with other nations to strengthen their capacities, the stronger those partnerships become and the more action can be taken on that basis. So I think um, sort of creating this quote unquote self-sufficient semi-ecosystem, um, it'll help us bring more to the table. 
I mean, we'll have to consciously avoid sort of this race to the bottom. And I think that's where some really important multilateral fora come into play, um, specifically thinking about the quad, thinking about the CHIPS4 partnership, um, thinking about some of those bilateral talks and bilateral um, cooperation channels. But um, it'll take concerted effort not to sort of step on each other's toes. And we've seen a few times um, when we have sort of stepped on other states' toes, thinking of the IRA, um, and we've had really uh, constructive conversations following those missteps um, to try and mitigate some of that tension. So I think um, it's wanting to be a better partner, but it's also uh, wanting to have really dynamic partnerships where we take advantage of each other's capabilities instead of just trying to stay out of each other's way. We've got a great question here from Justin Campbell. Uh, how do we see this affecting the expense and support of broadband internet services throughout the United States? And, and that gives me an opportunity to kind of bring this back to what we'll be doing on June 27th. P panel one is on kind of, you know, the issues with the electric grid. Panel two, we'll be talking about semiconductors and chips. And then panel three, we're going to be talking about the Buy America provisions, which have been a real source of concern in the broadband industry because the Buy America rules, which were strengthened in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, required that the 55% of the value of, of uh, equipment, including fiber cables, needs to be manufactured in the United States. And the problem isn't necessarily the fiber cables. The problem is the semiconductors. They're so uh, they are they are manufactured in the United States in such limited quantities, and the value of electronic equipment is so much in the semiconductors versus the fiber that it's going to be extremely hard to meet that fifty-five percent threshold for broadband internet service providers now. And that's just kind of playing out in in, in our industry and in the broadband industry uh, as we speak. Right? Will there be a waiver? Uh, for um, the the largest component of the broadband uh, build out, so I want to ask each of each of our panelists as well. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on how semiconductors meets broadband internet? Well, waivers uh, are almost certainly uh, in in our future. I, I don't see how U.S. Uh, output could come anywhere close to meeting the need. Um, so. Um, you know, perhaps the waiver would be something along the lines of you, uh, you you buy from certain uh, preferred uh, countries such such as our key allies, uh, but even then that that would be a challenge uh, to do. Um, you know, I know that the Department of Defense is, uh, or at least Congress is weighing um, mandating that the Department of Defense uh, not procure um, chips made in China anymore. Um, that's also doable eventually, but we're you know we're not there yet. And there's a, people have to realize there's a significant cost with putting these types of provisions in these bills. So I I would uh, forecast that waivers are uh, almost certain uh, because we were nowhere close to being able to produce that type of output in the United States uh, in the next few years. Well, we have really uh, covered a lot of ground. Uh, we have one more question here. Actually, Jacob, uh, you, thank you. You put in your email. Let's give each of our panelists an opportunity to offer any any last words or final thoughts on the topics that we've considered, you know, really unpacking the CHIPS Act. And maybe maybe if you could just one additional word on what, what you would say to those in the industry, in the semiconductor technology industry, for what they uh, should be doing and thinking about at this stage. And let's go in reverse order. So Hannah, some last words, Jacob, and then Martin will give you the final thought there. So Hannah, go ahead. Sure. So uh, one thing I didn't uh, really get to weave into my remarks earlier, but I think is really important is um, the workforce investments that are wrapped up in this, um, in this legislation. And I know that there's some um, sort of criticism about, for example, the child care component of that, but sort of zooming out wider, I think it's just important for all of us to keep top of mind that at the end of the day, the innovators are the ones driving innovation. The innovators are often in private industry, um, and they are also mothers and fathers and students and people paying off loans and people trying to feed their families. And so it sounds silly to say focus on the innovators when we're talking about innovation. It seems kind of obvious, but we have to support the very human needs of the humans that are making these advancements possible. 
that are going to sustain this development, hopefully, if all of this uh, investment pans out the way that we hope it will. Um, and uh, we need to work on capturing the right talent when it comes to making these advances, advancements and development in the future. Um, so I think there's also a really important conversation to be had on the margins of the actual action being taken within the legislation to talk about reevaluating how we're characterizing and filling tech sector jobs, um, including those in the semiconductor space. You know, are we still largely reliant on talent profiles with four-year degrees and advanced degrees, um, specifically STEM degrees, and what jobs really at their core require that sort of training versus what jobs could be very well filled by individuals who acquire those skills through other means. So for instance, certification programs online or apprenticeship programs, um, how can we be a little bit more creative about how we are approaching talent, how we're capturing talent, how we're utilizing talent? Because uh, again, if the whole point of this is to have long-term resiliency in the sector, resiliency is also going to come down to having the talent stores on the bench to keep filling these positions. As more positions open up, as technologies continue to evolve, the workforce issue is just never really going to go away. Well, thank you, and thanks for being with us. And uh, uh, Jacob, final thoughts that you might have. Workforce is absolutely key. Um, I want to touch on, on one other thing, which is uh, it's important to think very critically about our objectives here. If our objective is to diversify the supply uh, or the manufacturing of semiconductors and reduce supply chain risks, then reshoring manufacturing capacity is not necessarily required. What we need to do is diversify supply outside of Taiwan in the case of manufacturing advanced semiconductors. So this is why it's the, the data piece becomes really important because you need to understand where various stages of the semiconductor production um, chain are concentrated and then be able to work with allies to determine where, you know, we could support uh, that stage of manufacturing outside of where it's currently geographically concentrated. So this, this is a very complicated thing that the CHIPS pro program office is now starting to, to figure out. Um, and I, yeah, again, I think it's, it's very important to, to think carefully about our objectives here. Reshoring is very important in some circumstances, but it's not a panacea. Thanks. It was great Thank talking you. to you guys. And we'll give you, Martin, the last quick word here. All right. Well, uh, at a high level, what I want to see is an ongoing debate in this country on you know, what should the role of government be in, in uh, nurturing America's innovation ecosystem. Right? And so the CHIPS Act does that for semiconductors, but what does that look like for artificial intelligence, for biotechnologies, for quantum information science, and a whole slew of other critical technology areas that, that will largely underpin what the U.S. economy looks like a generation or two from now. Um, we're starting to have that debate, but it's it's infrequent and, and not very robust. And I think one of the important legacies of, of the CHIPS Act is um, allowing us to think more deeply and strategically about what that should look like across the board. Well, wonderful. Don't forget, we'll be talking in depth about this topic as well as others, advanced energy, rights of way, the Buy America provisions of infrastructure at the June 27th uh, Made in America Summit. On behalf of our great panelists who have walked us through so many topics here today, Martin, Jacob, and Hannah, I'm Drew at, with Broadband Breakfast, and we'll see you next week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.